I'm, as I said, director of the Prevention Research Center that's funded by CDC, and we've been in existence since the fall of 2009. And uh, when we envisioned our Prevention Research Center, we did go to the community, ask the community what major issues were for them. I happen to have an STD HIV background, so it was recommended to me many times that um, we work in that area. And when I went to the health department to try to work on clinical HIV intervention, they said we have so many problems and so many of them are so much larger than our clinic and so many of them are related to infrastructure. And so we've set out over the last four and a half years to try to really understand our local HIV infrastructure and figure out how we as an academic community can best work with the local community to try to reach vulnerable people. This is the HIV cascade. Many of you are probably familiar with it. And in Prince George's County, we have around 7,000 HIV positive persons and uh, about uh, 5,500 know that they have HIV and about 4,000 are linked to HIV care, about 2,000 are retained in care, uh, which uh, leads to about 1,500 who are successfully on ART, or on ART, perhaps not successfully, and uh, the successful uh, viral suppression is believed to be in a, around 1,000. And we now know from the uh, President's National HIV Plan that uh, we really do want to be focusing on having people know that they're HIV positive and having them get into care. And the biggest reason for that is we now know that if we can virally suppress individuals, not only will they not get full-blown AIDS and uh, become symptomatic, but they're much less likely to transmit the disease. So viral suppression is the goal. And clearly we have a very big issue around this in Prince George's. When we look at the HIV population just in Prince George's, uh, we see that while heterosexual HIV climbed uh, for a while, uh, we are again uh, an uh, epidemic that's led by men who have sex with men in Prince George's. This slide really shows the infra infrastructure problem that we're facing. We have a major epidemic in Washington, D.C. We also have a major epidemic in Baltimore. And those of us uh, then in this Prince George's region, focusing on this region, are uh, understanding the effects of that epidemic and it's reaching out into the suburbs. It just so happens that that jurisdictional border between the district and Prince George's is a very big barrier in many ways to coordinated STD HIV prevention. Uh, If we look at this slide, we see that the health disparities along the national capital border just in Maryland are huge. HIV incidence in Prince George's is much higher than HIV incidence in Montgomery, as is AIDS incidence, as are HIV deaths. And when we look at the Prince George's numbers, we realize that they're closer and affected by the District of Columbia, which is our epicenter. When we look at HIV care, HIV care is, is very related to primary care, and the primary care infrastructure in Prince George's turns out to be very poor, and we have a very low rate of physicians per 100,000 persons relative to Montgomery and relative to the district. So this border that we're looking at ends up being an extremely important phenomenon for us if we're trying to reach these vulnerable populations and get them into care. This issue of cross-state or cross-border coordination in terms of HIV prevention and treatment is not just an issue faced by us here in Prince George's when we're dealing with the Washington, D.C. Uh, metropolitan area HIV epidemic, which spans the district, Maryland, Virginia, and even into West Virginia, but Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Charlotte, Memphis, and other epidemics also have this cross-jurisdictional border issue that they need to contend with. We've been doing a lot of exploration about 
how this border does operate as a barrier to coordinated care. And we've started our project by talking to stakeholders and focus groups and interviews. And those stakeholders have included basically every sector that would be uh, impacted by the disease. And we learned that the stakeholders believe there are many benefits to cross-border collaboration. And we're focusing here on Prince George's County and the district. Uh, it enables organizations to reach a larger population, reach special populations, allow for synergistic use of funding, increase client access to care, decrease fragmentation of care, increase provider and client confidence in, healthcare, in the healthcare system, and it allows organizations to share expertise. It turns out that the populations in those two areas infected by HIV might be quite different. And so the expertise in Prince George's around HIV can be very different from the district. And so the district organizations may have a lot to learn from Prince George's organizations and vice versa. Barriers to cross-border collaboration include competition for funds, limiting funding policies, lack of time and energy, lack of leadership, lack of follow-through and commitment, mistrust by clients, and pro poor prior experiences. So we did a little study. We said, uh, what would happen if we had a Prince George's County resident who went into the district to, to try to receive care? And the reason why we're asking this question is we have such a deficit in the care infrastructure here in Prince George's. And the closest place for our population, our residents to go, would be the district. And it turns out the district has a highly developed HIV system of care. So when we, ended, when we called 15 different DC organizations and ask them whether, as a Prince George's resident, we could access medical, mental, dental care. What we learned is that people with no insurance may be able to get medical care. Um, five out of the 15 organizations would provide the medical care. Five out of the 15 organizations would provide the care to Ryan White eligible patients. Five out of the 15 would provide care to Medicare, Medicaid patients. And four would provide care to private patients, let alone dental care. So the clients in basically none of the organizations except one if they had private insurance, would they be able to access dental care? So we have this huge jurisdictional border issue we compare the organizations on each side of the border, we see that the district organizations tend to have larger budgets, not surprisingly. Uh, those organizations have expertise in education, training, and counseling somewhat more often than Prince George's County. Organizations, they provide health and medical services more often. Uh, the Prince George's County organizations, many of them are uh, community-based organizations, nonprofits that have very small budgets, that are floundering, that don't have the resources that they would need. The number of collaborations across border, again, is small, generally. And so at the Prevention Research Center, we have many different initiatives that we're undertaking. We have a STI coalition that we support. We're facilitating infrastructure in many different ways. We're working with Greater Baden, with the hospital, with the health department, and as much as possible with primary care physicians. We are part of regional HIV conferences. We have funded seed money projects. We're assessing patient-centered engagement in different health services. We're evaluating cross-border intervention pilots, a uh, number of different projects. And the project that I will just highlight uh, out of all these is we're trying to expand the DC HIV outreach model and that model is the Institute for Public Health Innovation model which uh, started in the district was expanded into Northern Virginia and then we've worked with IPHI to expand that model into Prince George's and that model is a community health worker outreach model and we're trying to see whether or not adding a community up here community health worker to the medical case management and medical team is more likely to find these out-of-care patients, link them into care, and retain them in care. So again, uh, many barriers to trying to reach these highly vulnerable 
people, and we have two other speakers that I think know quite a bit about that. So, could we have Derek Spencer? I don't know which one's yours. Well, hello to everybody. You had a fast lunch, and <laughs> some of you will be finishing lunch while I'm, while I'm speaking. My name is Derek Spencer. I'm the director of a program at the University of Maryland called the JOX Initiative. It's one of four medical clinics. The institute is taking care of about um, 5,000 people living with HIV in Baltimore, and I get to direct one of those um, clinics, so I'm glad to be here with you. In 2011, the World Health Organization and UNAIDS developed as a goal for a global approach to HIV getting to zero. It was a lofty goal that I had a hard time swallowing um, because of how challenging HIV care is. So getting to zero is about zero new infections, um, it's about zero death and zero stigma or discrimination. In 2010, the Obama administration released the National HIV and AIDS Strategy. And it's the first strategy for our nation to address HIV and AIDS. And it has four components, one to deal with incidents or new infections, secondly, access to care, thirdly, dealing with health disparity, and then something I feel really strongly about, and you hear Brad talking about this a little bit, is achieving a more coordinated response. I want to read the words of the National HIV and AIDS Strategy, and you'll understand why I'm saying it's time to use big words. Listen to this. It says, United States will become a place where new HIV infections are rare. I think that's a big word. And when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic circumstance, will have, <clears throat> excuse me, will have unfettered access. And I've been asking audiences, and I want to ask you, and put my glasses on so I can see you, when is the last time you used the word unfettered? It's a big word. It's time to use big words. Unfettered access to high quality, life extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. So our knowledge, I want to preface what I want to say today and that our knowledge of HIV, science, and treatment have a line that we expect a 19-year-old to live a normal lifespan if he or she is identified early and put on treatment. And so we're in a bit of a moment, but every moment requires a movement. And the movement that is needed is what this conference is about. It's a public health approach. I want to describe to you a public health approach that we're taking um, to address HIV um, at, the, at the University of Maryland. These are some statistics, and this is where we live, um, looking at um, HIV cases ranked by rates, and we'll see that Maryland um, has consistently stayed um, in the top 10, and you see where we are there. In the city of Baltimore, one person in 40 over the age of 13 is living with HIV. One person in 40. For African Americans, one in 29 over the age of 13 in Baltimore City is living with HIV. At the University of Maryland, where we have um, brilliant um, study going on and science um, and in the clinical arena, we have one person in 23 over the age of 13 is living with HIV. In that zip code and six other zip codes, um, and it's going to require an incredible approach using big words and using a public health approach to address it. This is a continuum of care for um, Baltimore, and you're seeing that about 14,000 people are living with HIV in Baltimore. But by the time you come down this cascade, only 22% of persons with HIV are virally suppressed. We need this to be like a goalpost. 
um, for football where HIV infection is, is, is pretty equal to HIV suppression. We will not get to zero with these type of realities. Um, and we're gonna talk about some things that we're doing to address the gaps in the continuum of care at the University of Maryland. The program that I direct, again, is called the Jocks Initiative. Today's talk is not about that, but I really wanna push you to the middle um, um, paragraph there that describes our mission. And our focus is to address stigma, facilitate greater access to HIV through community engagement, and transformation of individual and institutional approaches to address HIV in our cities. The model that we use to do the work that we do is something called the community engagement model um, that we developed uh, about six years ago. It has a broad definition of faith, um, and it has these different sectors of community not working alone, but significantly working in partnership. Working in partnership with, um, in the um, left-hand corner of what you're looking at, an HIV technical expert, that's somebody like Jocks. It could be a community-based organization, could be an aid service organization, but also working with our state and local policy regulatory agencies. So often we have people working in the community, but they're doing that solo. And this has to do with pulling those sectors together so that we can measure results. Very significant as we have this discussion today about the social determinants of health. We will not get to zero by just writing prescriptions, but we are making a call at the Jocks Initiative if we wanna change a city to engage the city. And I think that this data helps to support this. What you're looking at is some data from CDC where they did um, looked at issues, HIV tracks with social and economic disparities, um, particularly in, in this data set with heterosexual transmission. And they looked in urban areas and they looked at certain kind of social determinants of health and found the following, that if you had less than a 12th grade education, there was a two-fold higher prevalence of HIV associated with not having a high school education. The same thing if you were an unemployed versus employed. If you were living below the poverty level, higher issues of prevalence of HIV associated with poverty, and then issues with homeless versus not homeless. <clears throat> and to this group, that makes a lot of sense. But what we're trying to do through the work we're doing at the Jocks Initiative is to help the community understand what is your something. Calling for a public health approach. If you are a high school teacher or you're really interested in helping kids get out of school, that is an HIV prevention program. If you're really, really interested in housing inequity and making sure there's fair and equal housing, that is an HIV prevention program. So we don't need everybody to be prescribers, but we need our entire city to be engaged and we're, we're opening our arms to show people that there's something with a public health approach um, can make a difference. We started a program called Preparing the Future and the purpose of the program was to engage emerging professionals in the crisis of HIV and AIDS at the University of Maryland's founding campus. So we have on our campus, um, very rich campus with School of Pharmacy, School of Dentistry, School of Law, Social Work, Medicine, and Nursing. So we started a program um, initially with the School of Nursing and School of Medicine. With the School of Medicine, we did introduction to clinical medicine. First year medical students got trained in their um, curriculum to address HIV. They were offered service learning opportunities where they also got trained by the state to do HIV testing. And they tested in the community in pharmacies, they tested in our emergency department. Um, and nursing did the same thing and it was the nurse's responsibility to engage HIV testing into their um, curriculum. And I wanna read a testimonial from a guy who really um, blew us away in our first year. Um, his name is Matt Zietler, and he said, in my preparing a future experience, I was exposed to demographics and a culture very different from my own. As a native of a rural town in Southern Maryland, I broadened my awareness of diversity by working directly with the people of Baltimore. While I was in the emergency department offering HIV testing and linkage to care, I came to realize my own personal bias and prejudice. As future physicians, we need to be more self-reflective we need to be mindful of our own prejudice and bias and become more culturally aware. I will apply these important lessons to my future practice. 
will you? We're trying to prepare the future that the 2006 recommendations for HIV testing from the age of 13 to 64 would be realized. And in one of the previous um, presentations um, on the ACA about implementing science that has already been proven so that we can take and move this forward and begin to implement what we know about HIV testing. Um, we have engaged all six schools, so we are now in six schools addressing curriculum, doing interprofessional education, and we see the University of Maryland's campus as an avenue to address the national HIV and AIDS strategy. Not just medicine and nursing, but the entire campus. When we look at the gaps in the continuum of care, many of them um, um, need expertise as it relates to social determinants of health. So we are getting our lawyers and our dentists doing routine testing, getting our social workers involved, helping them to understand their something to make a difference um, in this crisis. You're gonna show you a, couple, a little bit of data from 2012 through 2013 with 129 students who did a pre and post test where we evaluated their knowledge, their attitudes, and their beliefs um, prior to us, the intervention, and then post the intervention. I think I've just um, brought three of the questions. Um, I'm able to discuss HIV in a culturally competent manner with my patients and my clients. Prior to the intervention, 43% said that. By the end of the intervention, 94% of them said yes. Question two, I'm comfortable talking about sensitive topics, including sex, with my patients and my clients. 67% um, said in the beginning, I'm comfortable. Um, by the end of the intervention, 92% um, brought that in. Um, I think that it's too complicated to offer HIV tests as a routine part of medical care. And this is really interesting to me with this. 85% said, no, I, I'm fine. At the end of the intervention, we did have more, but I do think we're in a moment where this generation is less encumbered with issues with sex and sexuality. And we have an opportunity in our large universities as we integrate issues like HIV into the curriculum that we can really make an incredible difference. You should not graduate from the University of Maryland's founding campus as a dentist, as a lawyer, as a doctor, as a social worker, um, as a nurse, um, in, a in a campus zip code where one in 29 African Americans have HIV, one in 40 people have HIV, as you do clinicals, you're gonna encounter people who are infected or affected by HIV, and we wanna make sure that our students are prepared um, to do that and make a difference so we can get our city to zero, because it's time to use big words. We also wanted to move from just the academic into the clinical. And we wanted to make sure that our students, not just from the classroom and the community, but when they went into a hospital experience or a clinical experience, um, they got a chance to engage HIV. And I think this is next to my last slide. We did, we started a pilot program. If you got admitted into um, the medicine service at the University of Maryland Hospital, that we trained um, multiple professionals, I think over 400 professionals, I don't know, um, uh, multidisciplinary professionals to offer HIV testing. <clears throat> Residents, nurses, nursing assistants, phlebotomy, we had to work with billing, and we had to work with the chief medical officer, chief nursing officer. Prior to our intervention in March, only 3% of persons were tested for HIV at the University of Maryland if you got admitted to the medicine service. It was launched in March 2013, and we began to measure offer rate and acceptance rate. And you'll see for um, basically from March to August, our offer rate was somewhere about 45% to 51%. Lots of challenge when you do a project like this in an academic setting um, because we've got people rotating and they're going on and off service. So staff were working hard, but, but the um, offer rate was only about 50%. In general, you see if we offer the test, people will accept it. What we did in um, it is September is to begin to engage the nurses, where the nurses work with the medical providers, and now that offer rate at its lowest has been about 80%. Um, We've had some months where that's been higher than 95% where you get offered the tests. Um, let's show you a little bit about the people that we're finding. Um, 
we found 40% of our positives have been men, 60% female. That's a little different of the makeup. It's a little flip of what we see in Baltimore City because it's typically the flip, 60% men and 40% women. Um, you'll see the mix where, as far as African American. Um, can I take you down to CD4 at time of diagnosis? So 14 out of 15 have had CD4 lab data and, um, or, or T cell count. And we are finding that the majority of these patients are AIDS-defined. These patients, about 70% of the people that we're finding are AIDS-defined. And of those who are AIDS-defined, we've got a good portion of them that have CD4 counts <clears throat> at the time of diagnosis that are less than 50. At, the, at a CD4 count of 200, you're declared to have AIDS. And when we look at data that I won't have a chance to show you today, many of these persons have been in and out of our presence in an academic setting, in a, in a, in a um, medical setting, and we've not offered HIV testing. And we're linking that to um, recurrent hospitalizations um, and a lot of morbidity. Um, and right now, we haven't had any mortality, but these folks are really sick. Um, and this program, with the academic and the clinical, a public health approach, to just operationalize what we already know to do, to offer HIV testing in cities, hard hit cities like Baltimore. Um, we've been able to link many of these folk into care, 93% of our newly diagnosed. Um, and then you'll see of the, uh, the amount of people that we're running into that are previous positives, um, that they are being linked um, into care. I think this is my last slide and we are expanding this approach which is really about implementation. Um, and we will move from testing at the University of Maryland, about 3,500 people a year under the JOCS initiative, to in the next 18 months, about 25,000. Um, just taking the principles of public health and implementing them to make a difference in our cities. Thank you. I know Baltimore has its own epidemic, but um, if we can really start talking about how we can expand the Baltimore medical clinical expertise into Prince George's. And I know that there's been discussions about that and it's very difficult, but we really need to try to make those connections. I think I inadvertently got us out of order, so I appreciate Hongji Lu uh, waiting a little bit to present. And Hongji, I will help you. And then I'll, I'll hope, we'll hopefully have a few minutes for questions. Uh, uh, speakers talk about HIV epidemic among um, risky population or hitting population. I'm talking about a specific approach used to sample hidden population given there's no sampling frame for you to draw a random sample. Um, using um, social network something like that. <coughs> this is my um, uh, this area. My this area folks on um, the social network to study the diffusion of <coughs> social network not enforcing and behavior, and also to study the transmission of HIV among um, hidden population. Uh, this is an uh, uh, example of egocentric social network. So what we get is an ego, the ego's peers in the social network we call elders. So this guy has five peers, five elders. From this ego, we get all of the information about his or her elders. Uh, give you a concrete example. This is social network of my recent creation. Even though this is a single graph, this is telling you 
that I have at least three class clusters of with intervention, for example, in this cluster, all of my collaborators are in China. In this cluster, all of my collaborators are in the United States. In this cluster, all of my collaborators are within our school, the University of Maryland. And also, you can see that in my network. I have very senior researchers, for example, uh, these two guys right here. And also, I have very junior collaborators. Uh, this all tells us that I have some very strong tie, strong collaboration tie, and some very weak collaboration tie. For example, Doug He, because he is in, in my department, we frequently change expertise in research or change uh, research experience. So, my tie with Dr. He is very strong. However, I have collaborated with this research, who is giant in social behavioral science. Even though I met him about two, one or two times, I got a lot of influence, positive influence from him. So in social network, we always say it is weak who make the final decision. So this is an example of ecocentric social network. Um, in my study, we use a model called social ecological or social network model to study the diffusion of risk behaviors. We use the same model for more than five projects and make more than two million grants. We are continuing to use this model make more grants. Testing. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just come back from China where we did a social network and risk and sex risk for HIV STDs among older female sex workers in China. Now China faced a new phase of epidemic. That is the epidemic starts spreading among older population and older female sex workers are the risk population who either transmit virus to other old clients or acquired virus from others. Um, the same lady provide sex to her old clients. Every afternoon, she provides sex to more than 10 clients in the same area. You can imagine the sanitary condition. You can imagine it is unlikely for this lady to negotiate with their clients to use the content to protect themselves. My study is using social network approach to see why some of the old female sex workers still use condoms to protect themselves given situations like that versus others who do not use condoms. Now, you may ask a question. Old female sex, sex workers are stigmatized, they are hidden. How can I recruit them into my study sample? Now, let me define what is how to reach population. The how to reach population are reading population because there's no sampling frame for us to draw random sample. And a small proportion of the general population, for example, older female sex workers is a small proportion of the total population in the city. If we conduct a survey, it's very costly. In some case, they're designed to remain anonymous. This is especially true for older female sex workers and for drug users. I provide several, several examples for the hidden population. Now, traditionally, we use a very famous approach called snow sampling approach, or sometimes you call chain referral sampling. However, 
Using this approach, you get a very biased sample because what you get is a sample that oversampled pop popular or cooperative subjects and non-independence of observes, meaning people who likely to recruit someone who look like themselves. Dependence of choice of seeds. Say if you select seeds, seeds are male. In your total sample, the majority of subjects will be male. So because of this, it is a challenge for us to, to do research among hidden population. Simply, we do, could not get a scientific sound sample using the traditional approach. And one popular approach recently developed called respondent-driven sampling, try to reduce the problem caused by snowball sampling. Um, the fundamental difference between these two approaches is that first, in RDS, we select seeds, initial sample. We ask the seeds re re to recruit their subjects. Theoretically, after you have a large number of recruit waves, for example, after five recruit waves, the bias introduced by your seeds could be largely reduced. And also, the second approach, which is missing in responding in um, snowball sampling, is that we use selecting probability to get a probability sample so that a sample could be used to represent your base population or your study population. And this is the difference. Okay, now here is the illustration of RDS. Say this is one seat, I give a seat three coupons, and the seat recruits three subjects into our study. After we interview each subject, we ask them to, rec to refer other three from their social network. So in the same way, we get the sample like this. After five web, you can see the RDS sample concentrate or pen, uh, uh, penetrate in your study population in every corner. Consequently, this sample can be considered as representative sample. Now here is one example from my own study, and this is cis, and this cis is very productive, reduce a lot of subjects. Say if this is your base population, and what do you get? Cover every corner of your population. Consequently, this is representative. And we use specific mathematical model to estimate the population mean by taking social network size and se selection probability as the middle stage. And this is the formula we used. Okay, almost there. For example, in this study, we estimate the proportion of money boy. The money boy are made for uh, uh, MSN who provide commercial sex to other MSN. We want to estimate the proportion of MB among MSN. Say, we interviewed 351 MSN and we found 48 uh, MB. If you, you use snowball sampling, this is what you get. In RDS, we get RDS adjust population, and this is the true proportion, unbiased proportion. You see the difference from here to here? Okay, this call, difference caused by this. The size of a social network are not equal among MSN and uh, among MV. Okay, uh, for more, because RDS involves a lot of technical issues, for more information, you can look at uh, my recent papers. Thank you. Thank you, Hongji and Derek. Uh, great presentations, and it's great to have this opportunity.
to uh, meet you and talk with you about your work. We have about five minutes. We don't actually have five minutes, but I'm going to make five minutes. Um, are there any questions, or would anybody like to make a comment? Yeah.